Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our fourth uh, webinar in the 2022 National Sea Grant Law Center webinar series. Uh, my name is Tara Bowling, and I'm Senior Research Counsel at the National Sea Grant Law Center. So we're very excited today to have presentations from three of our summer students. Um, just for those of you who are not familiar with the Law Center, we're one of the 34 Sea Grant programs, um, which are based at universities across the country. We are based at the University of Mississippi School of Law in Oxford, Mississippi. And our mission is to provide non-advocacy legal research, outreach, and education services to the entire Sea Grant network and their constituents. So if you're interested in any of the work that we do, please check out our website, follow us on Twitter or Facebook. Um, we are recording today and we'll post it on our website later once we get that uh, uploaded for future viewing. Um, everyone is muted right now. At the end of each presentation, we'll have a time for questions or we'll have time for questions at the end also. Um, so this summer we, huh? All right, um, so we're gonna hear from our three students. Um, first up, we're gonna have Betsy Randolph. Um, Betsy's a 2L at Lewis and Clark. Um, she is here for an eight week internship. During that internship, she's worked on our publications and several research projects. She's gonna talk about those. The next up, we'll have Zach Evans, who's part of the Sea Grant Law Diversity Internship Program. This is our third year to have the program. Um, we partner with another program in the Sea Grant Legal Network. Um, and so Zach has worked with both the National Sea Grant Law Center and also the Virginia Coastal Policy Center this summer. So he's gonna talk about his work with both programs there. And then finally, we have Kennedy Hertz. Um, she is an intern who is participating in the Sea Grant Community Engaged Internship Program. Um, that's a 10 week program for undergraduate students um, working on natural resource management issues facing underrepresented or indigenous communities. <clears throat> and um, she is a junior public policy major at the University of Mississippi. She's gonna tell us about what she's been working on. So with that introduction, I'm gonna turn it over to Betsy. Hi, I'm Betsy. Um, Tara, can you enable screen sharing? It says I am not allowed to. So like Tara said, my name is Betsy Randolph. I am a rising 2L at Lewis and Clark Law School, and I have been working with the Law Center this summer. So today I'm gonna to go over the major projects that I've worked on this summer, which include the TNC project, where I was looking at the rulemaking process for fisheries and kind of what that looks like and how long it was taking. And then I'm gonna talk about the publications that I did for the Law Center, which included both sandbar journal articles as well as blog posts for the website. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the research that I did on some opioid settlement agreements and how those could be used to protect the Great Lakes region. And then some additional research that I did on uh, viral hemorrhagic septicemia in the Great Lakes and the laws that have been passed by those states to try and address that disease in fish. And then I'm just gonna talk a little bit about some of my big takeaways from the summer. So to start out with the TNC project, what I did for this was I looked at six different rules that were issued by NOAA regarding fisheries. So some of these were about fishing gear, some were about quotas and kind of pulling those quotas over to different fishing seasons and then some other general fishing season regulations concerning dates and when things were starting. 
And to do this research, I kind of started out looking at the Fishery Council websites and figuring out when they had started talking about these rules because we were trying to build a timeline to see how long it was taking once the councils were discussing a new rule or regulation that was needed to when that rule was actually implemented. So I would start at the Fishery Council websites and look through their meetings and their agendas and look at when they started these discussions. And the first thing I noticed was that there was a lot of differences between the Fishery Council websites. So some of them actually built their own timelines and would kind of put all the different dates of when they started discussing things, when they drafted a rule, when they recommended something to the National Marine Fisheries Service, and then kind of when that rule was initially published, the comment period, which was really useful. And then some of the other websites were a bit different and I would kind of have to go through every meeting agenda to be looking at when they started talking about things and really dig through all of the dates and kind of search through their meeting minutes. And then once I had done that, I moved on to looking at NOAA's website and I was really searching for some of the NEPA documents. So when they were preparing environmental impact statements and kind of how long that was taking and if they were doing them. And that piece was actually the hardest part about this project because a lot of those documents just weren't being published or sometimes I would be finding the draft document, but the final document wouldn't have been posted or the fishery councils would kind of mention in a meeting that they were preparing an environmental assessment and that that was the next step. But then on their website and on NOAA's website, there was no posting of the document and that wasn't really anywhere. And sometimes they would have a contact person and they would be like, you can email them if you want the documents. And other times it was kind of like, it just wasn't there. So that was kind of the hardest part of working on this project. But overall it was really interesting and I learned a lot about how the fishery councils work and kind of how they were getting what they needed done done and when they were kind of listening to in the industry about what they were experiencing and then how long it was taking them to sort of address those issues. So that was the first major thing that I worked on this summer. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the publications that I did. This was sort of an ongoing thing that I worked on throughout the summer. So I would do these kind of, the first one that I did was the Pavlov Fulcombe opinion. I did that the first week that I was started and I wrote a sandbar article just about the opinion and kind of what it was talking about because the Ninth Circuit issued a ruling on the public trust doctrine and how it was applying to the Indiana shoreline. And it was in response to a previous ruling that they had issued saying that everything below the ordinary high water mark was part of the public trust in Indiana. And then a few landowners had filed a lawsuit saying that that was an unconstitutional taking of their property. And the court ended up saying that it wasn't since historically looking at the public trust doctrine in Indiana, that land had never actually been owned by those owners. So it couldn't be taken away from them since they never had it. So then the second, the second topic that I looked at was a national pollutant discharge permit that was issued by the EPA for an aquaculture facility in the Gulf of Mexico. And for this topic, I actually did both a blog post and then I extended it out into a sandbar article. And my process for looking at this, I started out with the permit process and how that had kind of developed because the EPA had issued a permit and then some environmental groups filed a lawsuit saying that they weren't allowed to issue the permit and they hadn't properly considered all the impacts that the aquaculture facility was gonna have on the Gulf. And then the EPA kind of had to go back and address a few things. And then they reissued a permit um, that kind of resolved some of the issues. And that's the permit that's currently in effect. So the facility now is kind of moving on to some next steps and other permits before they can start operating. And the third topic that I looked at here was the West Virginia EPA opinion that the Supreme Court issued a few weeks ago. So I also did a blog post and Sambar article for this as well. And I started out just looking at the background of the case, which was a bit convoluted because it had a weird pathway to the Supreme Court and a lot of groups 
thought that the court wasn't going to hear it. So there was a lot of different cases that have been happening in the background that kind of contributed to this case coming up to the court. And I looked into all of that and read a lot of the lower court opinions and kind of looked at what had happened there. And then I incorporated the information from the Supreme Court opinion and kind of what they had been saying. And one of the, this was probably the hardest topic that I looked at just because there was so much information. It was pretty hard to condense down into a smaller format. The Supreme Court opinion with the concurrence and the dissent was almost 100 pages, and there was just a lot of very dense legal information in there. And that was something that I noticed with all of these topics was that there was just a lot of legal information that wasn't necessarily the most relevant to understanding kind of what had happened in the situations and sort of navigating what to include in these articles, especially when not everyone reading them was an attorney or a legal professional and just putting all that information in a way that would make sense to people and didn't include some of the legal jargon that's more convoluted and not as clear. So those were kind of the publications that I did this summer. That was a really big ongoing thing that I had. So I'm gonna move into talking about the settlement research that I did and we, I started out with this research because we got asked about the settlement money that was gonna be coming to some of the Great Lakes states from both a Purdue Pharma settlement and a Johnson & Johnson settlement regarding the opioid crisis and whether or not that money could be used for opioid buyback programs to try and protect the Great Lakes from some pollution that was happening. And both of these settlements kind of arose out of a series of lawsuits that both of these groups were facing because of the way that they had contributed to the op opioid crisis. And with all of those lawsuits, they just turned into one big settlement. And the Purdue Pharma settlement just included Purdue Pharma and then the family that owns Purdue Pharma. And the Johnson & Johnson settlement had a lot more parties. So it was a much bigger payout because it was Johnson & Johnson and then like four to five distributors and manufacturers of opioids. And my kind of final product here was a memo that compiled, compiled all the resources on the agreement and kind of the distribution of the money. And one of the big things I was really looking for here was whether or not the money was kind of already spoken for and whether it was going to specific funds that were already kind of like, this is what the money will be used for, or whether these environmental groups and the Illinois and Indiana Sea Grant could kind of use them for their opioid buyback programs. And like the first project that I worked on, this, I also had some challenges with finding the information. A lot of the settlement documents weren't publicly available. And specifically with the Purdue Pharma settlement, they had reached an agreement, I believe last fall, and then a few of the states involved appealed, and then there was a new agreement made. And there was a lot of confusion in the sources that I was looking at about what that meant for the states who hadn't appealed and kind of who would be getting money. So a lot of people had a lot of conflicting information and I spent a lot of time for this project kind of sorting out what information everyone was agreeing on and what was kind of up in the air and people weren't really clear about. And then I tried to find some of the legal documents to see if that would clarify that information, which some of them did, some of them just weren't available to the general public and I wasn't able to locate them. So that was one of the big challenges with this project, but I was able to find a lot of the information. So then moving into the research that I did on the viral hemorrhagic septicemia in the Great Lakes. This is actually the project that I'm currently working on and I'm gonna be wrapping up in my last few days here. So my main task was just to research state legislation on VHS and see what states were doing to kind of manage VHS and if they were regulating kind of where fishing was happening and aquaculture and kind of what, what was allowed for moving fish within the state and how they were trying to regulate that. And then right now I'm working on kind of compiling all of those things so that it's easy to work through and see where the gaps in the legislation are and kind of what areas aren't really being addressed at this time. And then the other big part of this was looking at tribal ordinances 
and seeing if some of the tribes are regulating VHS or kind of trying to address the issue on their own or in coordination with the states, which is also the piece that I'm really trying to do right now. The challenge with the tribal ordinances is that a lot of them aren't necessarily available online and you have to kind of contact the tribes and see if they're willing to share the information with you and kind of getting hold of them can be difficult sometimes if the emails or phone numbers on their websites aren't updated. But I have found there's a few tribal resources online for researching tribal law, like the tribal law gateway, that's really useful and it'll kind of list out the tribes and sometimes link to the tribal website where the ordinances are, or it'll tell you that you have to ask for them and kind of direct you to like where you should be going which saves a lot of time so you don't have to kind of dig through Westlaw and Lexis and be looking for where these things are if they're online and then trying to find a contact person so resources like that have been a big help on this project and that's what I will be doing for the next few days. So I'm going to just talk about some of the big takeaways that I had from my position this summer. One of the biggest ones was just navigating some of the challenges with legal research and really how to do that in an efficient manner. Uh, specifically, kind of when to stop looking for something. There were just a lot of documents that aren't out there and aren't really available to find and kind of just aren't available to someone who isn't like part of what's going on. And so kind of navigating when's the point that you've exhausted all your options and when should you be moving on to something else and not wasting more time on something that you're not gonna find. So that was really a big thing that I kind of learned this summer and how to be more okay with like not finding the information and when to accept that it's just not out there and that you're not gonna find everything that you're looking for. And then the second big takeaway that I had this summer was how to kind of compile legal research in a cohesive way that's actually useful to other people. So I did a few different things this summer. I did a memo for the settlement project. And then for the VHS project, I'm kind of just doing a big compilation of all the statutes. And I think that's been a really important skill that I've picked up through this internship, just how to put together the information so that it's useful to someone else who's kind of trying to do something and how to take all the research that I did and put it into a format that includes everything they need and things that they might not have thought of while not overcrowding it with just every search result that I found. So that was a really big thing that I've learned this summer. And then the last thing is just kind of how to present legal research in a neutral and clear way. And I really took this away from a lot of the publications that I worked on and kind of how to take out the legal jargon and just put in the important information in an understandable way that's not really biased. I definitely noticed a lot of the sources that I was reading, kind of the way that they would slant things that were in the court opinion to kind of give the narrative that they wanted. And that's something that I found myself paying a lot more attention to after this internship. So that was a really big thing that I learned. So then just to kind of wrap up before I take some questions, I just wanted to say, Thank you to everyone at the Law Center. I really enjoyed my position this summer and I feel like I learned a lot of really important things that'll really help me going forward in law school and in my legal career. So I've really enjoyed it. So thank you for that. Then if anyone has any questions. Yeah, if anyone has a question, please feel free to type it in chat. We'll also have time at the end if you think of something as we keep moving on. All right. Um, thank you so much, Betsy. Really appreciate uh, hearing from you. All of your projects this summer were really interesting, I thought, and I really enjoyed hearing your, your takeaways from it. So next up, um, we're going to move to Zach Evans, who's going to tell us about his time here, as well as his time working with our partner, um, the Virginia Coastal Policy Center. So... All right. 
There we go. Sorry about that. Can you see it, Zach? Yep. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Zachary Evans, and I am part of the Sea Grant Law Center Diversity Internship. And I had a great summer here. I want to say a big thank you uh, to the whole team at the Law Center and University of Mississippi. Uh, as with many law students, I think exiting your doc, you, all the doctrinal coursework of your first year, it sometimes can be a little bit difficult to find your footing in things that are interesting and inspiring to you and the whole reason you went to law school. And I felt this whole summer, I was able to touch on a variety of topics I'm excited to talk to you, you about uh, that helped, I think, build my excitement for uh, continuing my 2L and 3L years. Uh, so I think the next slide, please. So as part of the uh, diversity focus, uh, I really liked this quote from the Strategic Virginia Sea Grant Strategic Plan. I feel that coming to the internship and my first year of law school from a big green advocacy organization, uh, I had worked and supported an environmental justice program through mostly communications online. And for me, being able to have this approach when it comes to centering vulnerable communities and seeing ways in which uh, existing knowledge, uh, both local and indigenous, I uh, can improve resilience and the policymaking process that gets towards it as something that really resonated with me. And so having the opportunity to focus both on vulnerable communities as well as to dive into uh, the intricacies of tribal law was just fantastic. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so an overview of what I worked on topic wise, uh, I knew coming in focusing on uh, the Virginia Coastal Policy Center, uh, VCPC, on their resilience work. Uh, that is something that I knew coming in and was excited to see what else I would be working on. And as Betsy mentioned in her presentation, being able to work on a lot of topics through case alerts, sandbar articles, blogs, being able to touch on a wide variety of ways in which water policy or coastal policy broadly, uh, this kind of the more specific topics underneath those was a great opportunity uh, to begin seeing what areas of broadly environmental law were the most interesting and intriguing. Uh, next slide, please. So for publications, uh, majority of my focus uh, for the Law Center focused on a sandbar article, so a slightly longer article about uh, a water uh, misappropriation controversy. And so that was uh, the Ute tribe of Uinta and Ure Reservation v. McKee. Uh, and that was a great opportunity for doing research and diving really into that. I also wrote a blog uh, on the very recent Supreme Court decision in Oklahoma v. Castro Huerta. Uh, that was also an interesting experience because the Sandbar article was going a little bit more of a deep dive, whereas the blog needed to be focused to an audience uh, that may not have uh, the experience to sort through legal jargon. And so that was uh, being able to talk about jurisdictional questions and trying to really think hard through how to explain them to a non-expert audience was challenging and really fun. Um, I think my experience in communications, mostly online, uh, I enjoyed being able to use some of those skills and further develop them, especially for legal topics. Uh, and then for the last publications, uh, the case alert summaries, that allowed me to touch on everything from fisheries to right to farm laws, as well as uh, access, um, when people have access uh, to public waterways in kind of clarifying that, uh, that was that was a really interesting one because in property, being able to learn a little bit about public trust and then seeing how that whole field of law, uh, the other additional questions that are, are currently pressing, that, that was fun. Um, next slide, please. So for projects, uh, 
the Resilience Adaptation Feasibility Tool or Raft Scorecard uh, through VCPC. That was the majority of my focus in the first part of the summer. The tool has been used to identify uh, resilience vulnerabilities uh, and general adaptation challenges for counties or localities in Virginia. And as you can imagine, a initial focus on coastal communities, those questions when it comes to a scorecard and kind of determining uh, certain levels of uh, existing policies that are working or, or gaps, looking at inland communities, there are different questions. There are different sorts of weather events that are uh, more common. And so being able to just do a deep dive into a very broad array of the challenges facing uh, central Virginia communities was, was a lot of fun. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, additionally, uh, through um, the Law Center, uh, doing some initial research on at least two states, uh, both looking at um, Washington State and Maine, and looking at uh, regulations that exist around the direct sale or marketing of wild harvest or aquaculture uh, by tribal by members of tribal nations. It was an interest. It's an interesting question, at least as I was doing my research, because trying to find who was speaking to this kind of more specific, narrow um, area of regulations, looking in state administrative codes, looking at legal research generally of journals and law review articles to see how this question might have been talked about. And then also finding on mostly websites uh, for specific tribes that also spoke to the same issue. It was interesting to see what gaps existed. And I think for me, uh, I would imagine whoever might be working on this project afterwards, seeing how they interconnect or what gaps may lead to conflict that has not reached the courts or not haven't been legal questions in front of the courts yet. Uh, for me, that was a really cool opportunity to start start that research. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, for VCPC, uh, I've had an opportunity to look at a report that is partially complete. Uh, a lot of research having been done, initial drafting stage, and to be able to come in and kind of get the lay of a land on a nutrient crediting uh, question, uh, the potential for nutrient crediting for aquaculture, uh, looking mostly um, at bivalves. Uh, that was a really, it's my ongoing project as I finish up the summer. And for me, the degree of science and being able to work with other interns at VCPC who are more coming from science backgrounds, that's just been a great learning opportunity. Uh, being able to hear what they're saying about specifics regarding science, reading some scientific articles, and then being able to say, okay, at a high level, it means this statement could be stronger. This statement, this claim uh, has a scientific basis. Uh, and being a non-scientist, uh, my parents are both scientists, uh, being a non-scientist and being able to get to the point where I can appreciate what the science is saying is always something that I know they'd be proud of me up for <laughs> uh, and something that is cool to see that interdisciplinary aspect to the research that the center is doing. Uh, that, that's been a fantastic experience. And I think mostly for nutrient crediting, looking at if say the feasibility may not reach maybe some of the goals originally posed by the inquiry, what are alternatives when it comes to bivalves, when it comes to, say, removal of nutrients from uh, the environment and being able to look into some of those other recommendations that are uh, integral to providing stakeholders some more information to make smart decisions when it comes to resilience in Virginia. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, so just to um, highlight two of the projects that I worked on a little bit more, uh, the U Tribe v McKee, this is the water controversy uh, case. This was really interesting to me, uh, being able to write an article uh, by looking at the function of precedent when it comes to the Montana exceptions. I think having my first year of law school done, being able to see the ways in which precedent are, is applied in the internship and being able to write about it, uh, I think in some great, in a great way has reinforced the things that I have learned and seeing how the court worked, the 10th Circuit Court of Appeals worked through their rationale in applying and considering uh, the uh, the U tribe's claim of a possible third exception. Uh, that was an interesting proposal to see uh, that legal theory and then how the court declined to accept that legal theory. Uh, that was just a, it was a, as someone who civil procedure uh, is sometimes a little bit more challenging in understanding jurisdiction, uh, being able to focus on that question was great <laughs> uh, to be able to show that jurisdictional questions are actually really fascinating. Uh, this was a, uh, a case in which uh, thinking about how legal questions around water access, which are in super press, incredibly pressing in the West, how we might consider water as being synonymous with say irrigation canals or yes or no, kind of thinking about what treaty rights allow. Uh, very fascinating case. Hopefully people have an opportunity to read it. Highly would recommend. Uh, and I know that being able to write for the sandbar means um, I have an opportunity to be published uh, and be able to uh, begin that kind of part of my legal career. So that was really exciting. Um, next slide, please. To go a little bit more into the RAF scorecard, I. Uh, the scorecard has a series of questions that helps a locality determine how prepared are they for a variety of uh, ad adaptation and resilience challenges. And being able to go through the scorecard and be on calls as uh, with localities who completed the scorecard and have taken the next step of creating a plan and, and then implementing it's been very, it was very interesting to see ways in which my notions of resilience were more narrow uh, before starting this internship. And now with the scorecard, seeing how it's not say just, for example, has a locality invested in green infrastructure? Um, have they restored their coastlines? Have they focused on that or do they have a plan for that? There's also the question of, what does food access and medical and healthcare access look like currently in the locality? Because during an emergency or weather event, those are the community, those parts of the community are most vulnerable. And what plans are in place to communicate with these parts of the community? What um, what are locally uh, sort or self-identified uh, potential policies that these vulnerable parts of the community may face. Um, what are their ideas? How can they be listened to? And I thought it was a very interesting way of being able to inclusively crowdsource policy. Uh, so for me, that was a really a, a really cool opportunity to expand my, my way of thinking um, and to begin a little bit of research uh, as well on the impact of flooding in inland communities and historically underserved communities, including tribal nations, and beginning to see what considerations may exist that should be incorporated into revisions of the scorecard. Uh, and feeling like having a little bit of part of that initial research, uh, knowing that the expansion to inland counties, uh, feeling good, feeling great about being part of that, that research. Uh, next slide, please. So carrying this experience forward, uh, just a great summer of learning more, reinforcing all the doctrinal coursework that 
uh, spent hours and hours uh, in uh, my 1L year. I, I know that leaving this internship, a definitely interest in finding opportunities, academic and otherwise, to explore tribal law and its interplay with a lot of the environmental uh, and conservation questions that are currently uh, being posed to a lot of localities and, and states and uh, the federal government. Uh, being able to work with public policy students as part of v VCPC, most of whom have a science background, their approach and the questions they ask and uh, the contributions and interventions they have when it comes to these big legal policy questions were just really fascinating. And so I know, at least with the school that I'm at, being able to take some of that coursework with a partner school to touch on public administration and planning, being able to, again, expand uh, my skill base to be able to address these really cool pressing questions. Uh, and lastly, uh, my interest in environmental justice and being able to find local knowledge and elevate it and amplify it, uh, seeing that operationalized through the RAF scorecard and seeing something that could really make a difference, uh, that was really cool for me and reinforced my excitement about those types of uh, resilience solutions. And I'll keep that with me uh, for my entire legal career. Absolutely. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you so much. Again, a big thank you to Tara for navigating the uh, presentation for me, and as well as the whole Law Center, VCPC, and the University of Mississippi. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Zach. I don't see any questions in chat right now, but we'll have time at the end if anyone thinks of anything after we're done with Kennedy's presentation. So thank you, Zach. It's wonderful to hear about all your projects and everything you've taken away from the summer. Thank you. So my name is Kennedy Hertz, and this summer I was the National Sea Grant Law Center Community Engaged Intern. Um, Tara, you can do the next slide. So basically, like she mentioned earlier, Tara mentioned earlier, um, my internship assignment was to conduct research related to marine, coastal, and Great Lakes policy with an emphasis on natural resource management and how it uh, how those issues affect indigenous and underrepresented communities. And a few of the assignments and activities I did over the summer was I attended Capitol Hill Ocean Week conference and various professional development sessions offered through the CEI Sea Grant. Uh, I wrote some blog posts, a sandbar article, a memo on indigenous and tribal communities and the rights of nature. And my final project is gonna be a paper on how climate change has affected indigenous populations in the Arctic. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the some of the professional development sessions uh, I had, I had, or sorry, I'll have done six by the end of the summer. Uh, some are still um, in the future. 
Um, and basically these are kind of designed for the students that got uh, scholarships from the C grants to, or not scholarships, internships, sorry, uh, to discover possible career paths, build their personal brand, develop and sustain community partnerships. And with that, I got uh, two Canals fellows uh, to mentor me. Um, and I just got one-on-one -on -one, like uh, training on like scholarships and graduate school advice, which is really nice because, you know, that's always needed. And then when I got to attend the Capitol Hill Ocean Week, that was a really cool opportunity because I got to hear directly from indigenous voices uh, about how ocean uh, policy and marine policy is kind of how it's affecting them, which was a really cool opportunity I got. Next slide, please. So some of the publishing, publish, sorry, some of the posts, uh, blog posts and articles I did. Um, the first assignment I had was a sandbar article and it was on the National Marine Fishery Services first draft of its equity environmental justice strategy. And basically that strategy uh, was seeking to identify underserved communities and the barriers that they face and how uh, National Marine Fisheries Service could kind of overcome these barriers and assist these communities and how they could incorporate equity into their everyday programs, policies, and activities. And then later in the summer, um, I completed two blog posts. One was on the court case giving uh, regarding giving legal personhood to Happy the Elephant. And the other was on California's new extended producer responsibility law. And just to give a summary, um, the blog post about Happy, um, that kind of coincided with the larger project, project I had about the rights of nature that I'll discuss later on. Um, but basically what happened, an advocacy group filed a common lit, law writ of habeas, habeas sorry, corpus in the New York Supreme Court um, demanding that Happy be recognized with legal personhood um, because they wanted ha Happy to have a more hospitable enclosure. And that was like one of the ways that they were attempting to get that done. But the court ruled 5-2 that there's no legal precedent that supports habeas corpus um, for non-human animals. So that was the outcome of that court case. And then my blog post about California's new extended producer law uh, kind of shifted the, it shifted the plastic pollution burden, burden from consumers to producers. And the law, not getting too much into it, but the law is going to require a 25% reduction total in single use plastics in California uh, by 2032. And no less than 65% of, pl of plastic products um, must be recycled with the rest being compostable in the same time frame. Um, so that's just really cool um, work coming out of California. And to kind of tie that to uh, indigenous and disadvantaged uh, communities um, to help lessen already existing damage that was done by that plastic pollution. The bill is going to establish the California Plastic Pollution Mitigation Fund, which is starting at $500 million annually. And 60% of those funds are going to go to disadvantaged communities. So that was pretty nice. Um, but a challenge I had with these assignments was kind of understanding legal jargon in general. Um, I'm not a law student yet. Uh, I'm still like, I just finished my junior year. So for me, some of the language was pretty difficult to grasp. And I kind of need to understand the concept of the law and the motives behind it for me to like understand it. So especially with the California Extended Producer Responsibility Law, I had to keep looking stuff over, looking stuff up over and over again, just like the wording. Um, but I think that actually helped me in the long run um, because I kind of learned how to simplify complicated scenarios that anybody could read because I was that person <laughs> that needed to be able to read them. Um, so that was, that was really cool. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is one of my larger projects, um, my Rights of Nature Laws memo. Uh, I, I answered the question, what are some of the efforts of tribal and indigenous communities in the United States and other countries to use rights of nature laws to force governments to acknowledge and respect their values and access to natural resources? And so listed on the slide are some of the key takeaways from the research that I did. Um, but for background, 
The rights of nature concept recognizes that ecosystems and natural communities have the inalienable right to exist and flourish. And because of this are entitled to legal personhood status to be able to protect themselves um, in a court of law. And the natural world plays an instrumental cultural, spiritual, and physical role in indigenous tribes' lives, which is why those two were kind of connected because indigenous communities have evolved with natural ecosystems um, around them over time. So, you know, their knowledge on how to safeguard them is pretty vital. And while this was one of my most interesting assignments by far, it was definitely one of my most vexing because throughout my research questions involving how rights of nature laws are handled and what exactly protecting an ecosystem entails kept popping up. And this was one of the main problems people who were trying to pass laws had um, because everything was so different um, from country to country, city to city. Uh, so it was just kind of difficult clarifying like the specifics on the laws itself. And that's just because it's, you know, a brand new concept that's kind of, well, not a brand new concept, but it's a concept that's difficult for people to grasp because in the past they've only seen nature as property rather than possibly having, you know, legal rights. And so, yeah. Um, but I had success in kind of, I originally had a, a very large memo and I shortened it uh, and made it into an infographic for, with four slides. So I thought it was uh, pretty interesting, like how much information can be kind of put together um, in a package size for, you know, people just on the fly trying to figure out something new. So that was something I thought was interesting. Next slide, please. And then, so my final project is going to be a research paper on how climate change has affected indigenous communities in the circumpolar Arctic. Um, I'm still working on it uh, because I have a few weeks left, um, but I have my outline listed on the slide. And basically, uh, the after the introduction, I'm going to talk about who's the most affected by climate change. Tribes in Canada, Alaska, Russia, and Norway have already been like experiencing serious effects of climate change um, already. And these climate change, these physical effects have kind of caused irreparable damage on these communities and their physical security has obviously been compromised. And because of that, their culture has been compromised because it's breaking like, you know, their mixed economies that they've had for years and years. They're losing traditional ecological, ecological knowledge and they're kind of having a lack of group identity and intergenerational transmission of culture because they're not able to do what they once did. And I'm gonna highlight this with a case study uh, about the Alaskan village of Kivalina. And they had to relocate um, on the barrier island that they have lived on for a really long time. And despite them already relocating, the US Army Corps of Engineers have already predicted that due to coastal erosion and rising sea levels that their, their town that they just relocated from might be uninhabitable by 2025. So it's just, it's so difficult for um, these indigenous people uh, to kind of exist there. And so I think that this paper is really gonna highlight um, how important that is. Uh, and then my next topic in the paper is gonna be other stressors on the Arctic community um, because global, or sorry, great power competition has kind of accelerated climate change and that's left a huge impact on these communities as well. And now I'm gonna conclude my paper with adaptation strategies that can mitigate further harm from being done to these communities. And yeah, after Tara, you can do the next slide. Um, I just wanted to thank the Sea, uh, sea Grant uh, Law Center. Oh gosh, sorry, I'm nervous as well. Um, I still have a few weeks here though, so y'all can still talk to me, <laughs> but thanks. All right, thank you so much, Kennedy, for sharing that, your experiences and all your projects. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, you can raise your hand to ask those, or you can ask them in the chat. Um, but we've been really lucky this summer. We've had a great crew. Um, students have really helped us increase our capacity as we work on all these projects. Um, so we really have enjoyed having all three of these students here this summer.
All right. If anyone, um, I think Kathy put it in the chat, but um, the students' articles will be out in the sandbar by the end of the month. And so you can watch, um, you can subscribe to that. Um, you can also watch Facebook or Twitter. We try to update there when we post a blog post or um, Sandbar gets published or the Ocean and Coastal Case Alert gets published as well. But thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we'll post this recording as soon as it's done. And oh, we have a question, sorry, from LaDawn. Hey, thank you. And these are great presentations. Uh, I was very interested in hearing the, the presentation about rights of nature. And it's a new term to me. So I've done a lot of reading recently. And, and I, I guess some of the things that I've read implies that there are no laws that protect nature, such as Endangered Species Act, all the permitting has to be dealt with. So the question is, I mean, what, what framework do we have in existence now that's not working to protect the rights of nature? So basically all the laws that are in the framework now, it's basically allowing a certain amount of, I guess, harm to occur because by saying like, for example, the rights to nature is, uh, law is like this wild rice basically has the right to grow and flourish as much as it can. Whereas another law about wild rice could be like, this amount of pollution is allowed to occur before we say like, no, this has to be changed. So it's basically giving, it's basically changing the laws from, sorry, I don't know how to word this. It's basically changing everything from kind of a defensive to like an offensive, like the, it's protecting the rice before you need to or protecting the nature before you need to, if that makes sense, sorry. <laughs> I think that's a good way to put it, Kennedy. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, so we will conclude the webinar. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you to the students for those wonderful presentations. Um, please watch our Facebook and Twitter for any upcoming announcements. Um, Oh, about uh, our webinars in the future. Thank you.